So this morning, there's uh, subjects that we generally don't talk about in polite company. We don't talk about sac- uh, politics, sex, and money. Well, today, we're going to talk about one of those subjects. And so whether you call them bucks, dough, bread, moolah, cheddar, paper, stash, Benjamins, Benji, loot, and smackers, maybe you call them bones, tamales, scratch, cheese, lettuce, skrill, chips, cake, or cabbage, Many call them dead presidents, even though Alexander Hamilton on the 10 and Benjamin Franklin on the 100 were never presidents. Of course, we're talking about money. Now, I know this is a tough subject. It's also one that we rarely talk about here at BCC. We've tended to go out of our way to make sure that any conversation that we have about money doesn't seem to be self-serving to the church. And yet, the Bible so often speaks of money, and so often preachers today take those uh, verses out of context to meet their own agenda. And so I think that to some extent we've done a disservice in not talking to you more about it. So this morning we will, as we continue our series in Straight Answers, today we answer your questions about money. Let's pray. Father God, money is a tough subject, Lord. Father, it wraps around each and every aspect of our lives and can draw us down, Lord. It can be deceiving, and Lord, it can be such an entanglement. But your word, Father, is clear, and so I just ask, Lord, that as we speak now about your word, that it would just become crystal clear to each one of us. They would cut through us like a knife right to our very hearts, and that, Father, our own selfishness would fall away, our own deception would fall away, and that, Lord, we would understand who you are that you are an amazingly big God. Father, I ask that you would just come and you would move amongst each heart here. I ask, Lord, most of all, that you would move on my heart. Fill me afresh, Holy Spirit, from the soles of my feet to the crown of my head. Lord, I ask that every cell in my body and fiber in my being would scream out the glorious name of Jesus, for there is nothing that this man has to offer. So, Father, I just ask that you would fill me to overflowing, that I'd be a drink offering to you. For, Lord, we need to hear you. We need to hear words of life. And so we just give you all the praise, all the glory, and all the honor. In Jesus' name, amen. Truth is that we could spend the next year going through verses about money. I've got about 20 minutes. So we'll cut to the chase here. How many verses are there in the Bible about money? 200? 500? How about 1,000? Actually, there's over 2,000 verses in the Bible about money. Nearly 40% of Jesus' parables use money as a theme. God has a lot to say about money, but probably not what you think or what you've been told. God doesn't give advice. He isn't telling us how much life insurance we need or how much money we need to retire. He doesn't give us a target price to buy Amazon or Bitcoin. The Bible doesn't tell us what our debt-to-income ratio should be or what the minimum wage is supposed to be. The the parable of the hidden treasure in Matthew 13 is not God's counsel on the value of buying real estate. I don't have time to go into all the topics that really need to be covered today. But let me start off by saying this, that I'm no way advocating that we don't have an obligation to deal rightly with our finances Especially as Christians, we need to pay our bills. We need to deal rightly with the government and pay our taxes. I'm not saying that having savings is bad or being poor is good. Well, I believe the Bible tells us that we should not have excess debt. I don't believe that it says that we're forbidden to have a loan. I know that there are those out there, including Dave Ramsey, who advocate a certain position, being debt-free. I agree that that is good secular advice. However, when one focuses on money as the goal, no matter which side of the balance sheet you're on, it's a bad goal. When Dave Ramsey has people yell out that they're debt-free on his radio program and then tells them that they're well on their way to being millionaires, it only reinforces the point that money is the object. Please don't use the Bible as an excuse to accumulate your wealth. If you're struggling spiritually, it will show in your finances, both sides as well as in your marriage and other relationships and in all aspects of your life. Get right with Christ. 
He has the plan for your present and your future. It just may not be the plan that you want. But from Genesis to Revelation, God does make one thing exceptionally clear. He owns it all. Let me say that again. It ain't yours. It's his. God owns it all. And what he wants us to do with his money is to be generous. Be incredibly generous. No matter how much or how little you have, God wants you to be generous. Generous to the church. Generous to your neighbors. Generous to the orphan and the widow. And generous to the stranger. God is a generous God, and he wants us to reflect him in all of his fullness. Well, this gets us to question number one. Well, what about the tithe? It's an interesting question. The tithe is generally considered a measure by which one calculates the amount of their income that they are obligated to pay the church, to give to the church. Tithe actually means a tenth or 10%. It's a command that comes out of the Mosaic Law, specifically in Numbers 18, as the Levitical tithe, the support of the tribe of Levites, who were the tribe of Judah with the responsibility of maintaining the temple. They had no rights as landowners, and therefore the the Levitical tithe was their inheritance. Yet many churches will say that the tithe remains a command of the church, and therefore you need to give us, the church, 10% of your income. The Mormons, along with others, go so far as to tell you that you have to bring in your pay stub or your tax return as proof that you're, in fact, tithing. They'll even cite Matthew 23, 23. Skip, can you put it up? What sorrow awaits you, teachers of religious law, these are the Pharisees, hypocrites, for you are careful to tithe even the tiniest income from your herb gardens, but you ignore the more more important aspects of the law, justice, mercy, and faith. You should tithe, yes, but do not neglect the more important things. See, they will say, even Jesus says to tithe, but we'd miss the point. Let's forget for a second that there's also an annual 10% festival tithe as commanded in Deuteronomy 12, 14, and 26, or the charity tithe as listed in Deuteronomy 14 that requires 10% additional on the sixth and the, the excuse me, the third and the sixth year of the seven-year societal calendar. If you calculate that up, that's an annualized required amount of 23%. This doesn't take into account the burnt offerings or the free will offerings. And let's also not forget that the Old Testament requires that these tithes be paid in two forms, in grain and in animals. Now, I've been at BCC for nearly 15 years, and I have yet to see anyone offering up grain or an animal. And that is not a challenge. Please don't put anything on my desk. (laughs) I know one of you is going to do it. I know it. (laughs) We don't have time to go into all the theological issues with a tithe, but suffice to say, we here at BCC don't believe that there's a biblical requirement for the church to tithe. And one of the important reasons is that if you give 10%, who owns the other 90 We tend to believe that the other 90 is us, and that's not true. God owns it all. So we really want to take a quick look here at what Jesus has to say about giving in Mark 12, 41. Skip. Jesus sat down near the collection box in the temple and watched as the crowds dropped in their money. Many rich people put in large amounts. Then a poor widow came and dropped in two small coins. Jesus called his disciples to him and said, I tell you the truth, this poor widow has given more than all the others who are making contributions, for they gave a tiny part of their surplus, but she, poor as she is, has given everything she had to live on. Clearly, Jesus isn't impressed with the large gifts of the wealthy, but he was of the only thing that the widow had. Why is that? Because she had faith to rely upon God for all the provision that she had. It was her faith that impressed Jesus. And the widow wasn't planting seeds of faith with an expectation of money in her bank account. She wasn't standing on the promises of God to provide her with a new fully loaded camel. She had faith and she trusted in God. Let's forget here, Jesus does not need your money. The word proclaims that our God owns the cattle on a thousand hills. The world is his and everything in it. He doesn't need your money. But he does want 
your heart. Which brings us to question number two. Well, if we aren't supposed to store up treasures on earth, what should we as young people do about college and career? This question brings up one of Jesus' most famous statements in Matthew 6. Skip, can you put it up? Don't store up your treasures here on earth where moth eat them and rust destroy them, where thieves break in and steal. Store your treasures in heaven where moth and rust cannot destroy and thieves do not break in and steal. I love this question. I love it for a number of reasons. First of all, Sydney, my oldest, is going off to college next year, and we've spoken about this very question. I also love it because it is so rare that young folks are thinking about how they should be looking at their own relationship with Christ and how they need to be accountable for the decisions that they make. The problem is that this question needs to be asked at all. It reveals that we have a fundamentally failed as a church to express to our children that we are called to be followers of Christ, to be servants of Christ everywhere we go. If we're born again, then we are filled with the Holy Spirit who Jesus calls the helper. It also points out that somewhere along the line, we have segmented our lives into the secular and the spiritual. What do I do for my life, for work? And what do I do in my life for Christ? As if they're two separate things. I think all too often we make our own plans and then we ask God to bless them. The Old Testament gives us a great many examples of people who made their own plans and we can see the havoc it caused in theirs and other lives. And yet there is one example that I want to look at today. Skip, put up 1 Kings. That night the Lord appeared to Solomon in a dream and God said, what do you want? Ask, and I will give it to you. Wow. Here we have Solomon, the young son of David, the great ruler that brought a smile to God's face, so much so that God promises the Messiah through his lineage. Here is his son Solomon, new to the throne, and God is asking him what he wanted. How would you respond? How would I respond? Will we look at this moment as a genie in the bottle moment? I get three wishes, cool. But that's not how Solomon responds, is it? Skip, put up the next verses. That night the Lord appeared to Solomon in a dream, and God said, what do you want? And I will give it to you. Solomon replied, you showed faithful love to your servant, my father David, because he was honest and true and faithful to you. And you have continued your faithful love to him today by giving him a son to sit on his throne. Now, O Lord, my God, you have made me king instead of my father, David. But I am like a little child who doesn't know his way around. And here I am in the midst of your own chosen people, a nation so great and numerous they cannot be counted. Give me an understanding heart so that I can govern your people well and know the difference between right and wrong. For who by himself is able to govern this great people of yours. Solomon asks for an incredible question for, for an incredible gift. He asks for wisdom. What Solomon is really asking was, God, let me see things as you see them. Solomon's heart was to know what the heart and the mind of God was so that he could be the hands and feet, to be a servant of the living God that he was called to be. And how did God respond to David's request? Skip next verse, thank you. The Lord was pleased that Solomon had asked for wisdom, so God replied, because you have asked for wisdom in governing my people with justice, and have not asked for a long life or wealth or the death of your enemies, I will give you what you asked for. I will give you a wise and understanding heart such as no one else has ever had or ever will have, and I also give you what you did not ask for, riches and fame. No other king in all the world will be compared to you for the rest of your life. And if you follow me and obey my decrees and my commandments as your father David did, I will also give you a long life. I don't want you to miss this. God saw Solomon's heart and he recognized Solomon's humility. Solomon wasn't asking for selfish gain. He didn't ask for wealth or power or long life. 
or the death of his enemies, which would have ensured that he had a long life and wealth and power. But God blesses him with wisdom and then with wealth and power. The question again was whether what we are supposed to do as young people, if we aren't supposed to store up our treasures on earth, should we go to college? So I will answer this question in typical rabbinical fashion with a question. Why are you going to college? What's your motivation? If your belief is that college is a means to a good job and a good job is a means to money and money is a means to a nice house and a car and a life and then retirement and so on, then no, that's not how we are called to live in Christ. My answer to the question is to be like Solomon. Be a servant of the Most High God. As the master, he will guide your steps. And he will determine where he will send you. If he sends you to school, go. And do well as you do all things unto the Lord. If he sends you into the military, go and do well. If he sends you into the workforce, be the light of Christ in that place. If you're concerned about the pull of the world corrupting you, you should be concerned. Pray. Be accountable. Don't fall victim to the world's trappings of wealth and money. Be on constant vigil against the world's view of money. Which brings us to the third and last question for the day. It is we are to be in the world, not of it. What does that mean practically? Well, that's a great question. First of all, we recognize that this isn't a specific quote from the Bible, but it's a weaving together of Scripture that communicates a very good point. First question that we need to ask is, what does it mean to be in the world? When we read the world in the New Testament, we are reading the Greek word cosmos, Cosmos most often refers to the inhabited earth and the people who live on the earth, which functions apart from God. Satan is the world of this cosmos. By the simple definition that the world refers to a world system ruled by Satan, we can understand and appreciate what Christ's claim is, that if we're born again follower of Christ, then we are no longer of the world. We're no longer ruled by sin, nor are we bound by the principles of this world. In addition, we are to be changed into the image of Christ, causing our interest in the things of this world to become less and less as we mature in Christ. Believers in Jesus Christ are simply in the world. We're physically present, but we're not of it. We're not part of its values. As believers, we should be set apart from the world. This is the meaning of being holy and living a holy, righteous life to be set apart. We are not to engage in the sinful activities the world promotes, nor are we to retain the insipid, corrupt mind that the world creates. Rather, we are to conform ourselves and our minds to that of Christ Jesus. We read that in Romans 12, 1 and 2. Skip. Therefore, I urge you, brothers, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as living sacrifices, Holy and pleasing to God, this is your spiritual act of worship. Do not conform any longer to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. This is our daily activity. This is our commitment. We must also understand that being in the world but not of it is necessary if we are to be a light to those who are in spiritual darkness. We are to live in such a way that those outside the faith, they see us, how we act, what we say, as different than how the world is in good times and in bad. Do we rejoice in the same way that the world rejoices and for the same reasons? Do we mourn in the same way that the world mourns If you call yourself a Christian, then you act no differently than those who are around you, even those who say they have contempt for God. What does that say to the world? What should that say to you? Even the heathen knows that by their fruits you shall know them. As Christians, we should be exhibiting the fruit of the Spirit that is within us. Being in the world also means we can enjoy the things of the world, including the beautiful creation God has given us. 
And yet we are called to worship the creator, not the creation. We are not to immerse ourselves in what the world values, nor are we to chase after worldly pleasures. Pleasure is no longer our calling in life as it once was, but rather the worship of God, which is the true pleasure that we now have in our lives. I wish I had more time, but I'm going to just take a moment as we finish up for communion to address how the Bible handles the accumulation of wealth and retirement. See this in Luke 12, 15. Skip. Then he said, beware, guard against every kind of greed. Life is not measured by how much you own. Life is not measured by how much you own. This was a radical concept to the disciples. The rabbis had, advi- had established a false narrative that God's blessing was upon the wealthy. It was the prosperity gospel of their time. It, was a radi- it, it is a radical statement even to us as Christians today. I want you to think about how you respond to the understanding of God's blessings. I was blessed with a new job, a better car. My health is better. My child got an A in math. And we could go on and on, and we call those blessings. Let me ask you, though, a question. Is that any different than somebody who's out in the world? Would they think about those things any differently? My question is, how many of us can see that the true blessings of God may come when God takes away the distractions in our lives, when he removes the little or not so little idols? How many of us can see our house going into foreclosure as a blessing? How about breaking an arm or having a child go wayward? See, Jesus is just simply saying here that life is not measured by how much good stuff we have. Money, fame, power, health, you add on to that list. These things are a measure of the world that the world defines as good. But if we're in Christ, Jesus is telling us that it isn't the way that he measures us. And if it's not the way that he measures us, then it shouldn't be the way that we measure ourselves. But Jesus goes on in this parable to warn us against what happens when this happens in our lives. Then he told them a story. A rich man had a fertile farm that produced fine crops. He said to himself, what should I do? I don't have room for all my crops. Then he said, I know. I'll tear down my barns, and I'll build bigger ones. Then I'll have room enough to store all my wheat and other goods, and I'll sit back and say to myself, my friend, you have enough stored away for years to come. Now take it easy. Eat, drink, and be merry. But God said to him, you fool, you will die this very night. Then who will get everything you worked for? Yes, a person is a fool to store up earthly wealth, but not have a rich relationship with God. By all accounts, the rich landowner is successful, so much so that he can't hold all of his bounty in a worldly way. Who wouldn't want to be this guy? I've shared this parable before when I spoke about Steve Jobs, who like this rich landowner, died in his sin building bigger barns. The rich landowner's goal was to retire. Doesn't sitting back, eat, drinking, and being merry sound good? I get it. The question is, is that the Christian life? Are we called to work for a period of our lives to accumulate wealth so that our reward is to experience leisure? Jesus calls this foolish, and yet aren't we caught in this very trap? I can't tell you how many people that I've spoken to who will say to me, well, I only have seven years, four months, 21 days until I get to retire. Maybe that's you. Why is it that they say that? Well, because they get a pension. They have security in knowing of what they think is to come How is that any different than the rich landowner? He thought he knew what was to come. A life of eating, drinking, and being merry. That was his plan. But what was God's plan? He was going to die. And I'm sorry to be the one to tell you this, but so are you. And so am I. And our lives would have been wasted on the wrong pursuit if our goal is wrong. 
If we are aiming for the goal of working to achieve financial success in a life of leisure that it can afford you, then you may or may not get that in your life. But what's for sure is you will miss the real point of life, and that's to glorify Christ. When Jesus said, you cannot serve two masters, you cannot serve both God and money, this is what he was talking about. You either are a servant of Christ, pursuing his will, his kingdom, his way, or you serve your own way, the way where your money is your object and your passion, and where you get to define success. But I'm telling you, that's the way to destruction. I want to end where I started. Here is the point of money. From Genesis to Revelation, God makes one thing perfectly clear. He owns it all. And what he wants us to do with his money is to be generous. Be incredibly generous. No matter how much or how little you have, God wants you to be generous. Generous to the church, generous to your neighbors, generous to the orphan and the widow, and generous to the stranger. God is a generous God, and he wants us to reflect him in all of his fullness. Father, I thank you that you are a God who is so incredibly generous. You are generous with who you are and the relationship that you call each one of us into. Father, I know that money can ensnare us, that the sense of security that we get from looking at our bank accounts, Lord, is what the world would tell us is, defines us. But Father, you are the one who provides our security. For, Father, as we've said over and over again, we come to a recognition. We fully understand all of this burns. It all has no eternal value. But you do, and our relationship with one another does. And so, Father, I just ask that you would unleash within us a new understanding where money would be set down. That those chains that bind us that cause us fear and anxiety, frustration and worry. Or maybe, Lord, we look at our bank accounts and we feel pride and arrogance. Father, whatever it is, I ask that it would be broken right now in the name of Jesus. And I ask, Holy Spirit, that you would be unleashed in a new, a powerful, and amazing way. And we just give you all the praise in Jesus' name. Amen. Now may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you. May the Lord be just working in each one of our hearts that he is enough, that he owns all and that we surrender more and more each day to him. He is faithful to care and provide for all the needs that we have. We just thank you. Amen. Have a great day.